How do you determine the fluid needs of your patient? How do you determine how much energy your patient is going to need every day? These are the two things we're going to focus on as we continue this deep dive into surgical nutrition. Hi again, my name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon and welcome to Citizen Surgeon, where we help you gain the critical surgical knowledge that you need for the wards, the operating rooms, the ICU, and of course, to crush your exams. If you haven't been able to sign up or subscribe yet, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, hit the reminders tab, leave some comments, get engaged, and learn everything you can know about surgery. In today's talk, we're gonna focus on the fluid and energy needs of your patient, and this is absolutely fundamental to understanding total parental nutrition and knowing what you need to give your patient perioperatively to make it through. Now, the way I like to start off all of these videos is to go over the review clinical question that we talked about last week, so here we go. So you have a 63-year-old male presents to the office for difficulty swallowing in a 10 kilo weight loss over the last two months. He has a new diagnosis of esophageal adenocarcinoma and you're evaluating him for an esophagectomy. With respect to nutrition, how will you evaluate this patient? Is he at severe nutritional risk? And how can you provide preoperative nutrition? All right, so if you haven't had a chance to watch the first video of surgical nutrition on the nutritional assessment, then definitely click on the card and go ahead and watch that video. But to answer this question, so how do we evaluate the nutritional status of this patient? So first is, I'm gonna to go to the patient's bedside, I'm gonna see him in clinic, I'm gonna perform a detailed history and physical exam. In that history, I wanna get a sense of how much weight loss he's had, and what the rapidity of that weight loss was. I wanna know what his fatigue levels are, what are the activities of daily living that he's able to do. I wanna get a sense of his swallowing. Is he having difficulty swallowing solids and liquids or just solids? Where is it getting stuck? Does he have any painful, painful swallowing? Has he had any vomiting? Has he had any hematemesis? Does he have any abdominal pain or other discomfort? So those are some of the things in the history. In the physical exam, I want to get a gauge of his anthropometric data. This, I want to get a current weight. As far as further evaluation, I want to get some baseline labs. I want to get a CBC and look for anemia. I want to get a BMP and I want to look at his renal function and see if his electrolytes are normal. And I want to get some nutrition labs like we talked about, including albumin, prealbumin, maybe a transferrin. The albumin level will get us a sense if he is uh, at increased risk of infectious problems or infectious complications, as well as increased mortality uh, after his operation, I would guess with the 10 kilo weight loss, he's gonna have a low albumin. The prealbumin and transferrin will also give us an idea of his nutritional status with a little bit shorter T half-life and a little bit more of his more recent nutritional status. Is he at severe nutritional risk? So we went over those four criteria for severe, severe nutritional risk last time, so go watch the video. But yes, he's had 10 to 15% weight loss over the last six months, so that is just one of the four factors that you need. Also, if his albumin level was less than three, then that would put us at a in severe nutritional risk, and that would mean that he's gonna need preoperative nutrition. How can you provide preoperative nutrition? So in this patient, you have a couple of options. By your history, you're gonna know, is he solids or liquids? Does he have dysphagia to both of those? Well, then you couldn't do oral nutrition with some NSHORs or something like that. So then you're forced to go down another right. If you wanted to provide enteral nutrition, you couldn't do a PEG because that might be the conduit that you would use for your esophageal replacement. But maybe you would wanna do a um, jejunostomy tube. If you wanted to go with straight IV nutrition, then of course you could do a pick line and give parenteral TPN for seven to 10 days and reevaluate where your nutritional status is. So now I think we have a grip of the nutritional status. And what I want you to think about is I need to take a good history. I need to find out about weight loss. I need to do an examination. I need to measure their BMI. I need to check some labs and see where they're at, have a look at the albumin, and then do a good analysis of what their risk factors are preoperatively and would they benefit from preoperative nutrition or not. And now we're gonna move on to kind of the guts of this, and that's fluid and energy. 
So when I talk to the medical students, when the residents, I like to say, well, what is parental nutrition? All it is, is a bag of fluid and energy. All right. So you have an amount of volume of fluid that the patient needs for the day. And then you have a bunch of energy that you have to give to the patient. That's as simple as it is. Now we'll get into like the micronutrients and you know, the, um, the minerals and the, you know, maybe some vitamins that you have to put in there. But in the simple terms, think of a bag of TPN as just fluid and energy. Now we can look at the fluid first and how do you determine the uh, fluid requirements for a patient? There are a lot of different rules um, because I'm a pediatric provider and I have a lot of people that are less than 20 kilos. I use the 421 rule and that means that you use four mils per kilo for the first 10 kilos, add that to two mils per kilo for the next 10 kilos, and then one mil per kilo of fluid over 20 kilos. And we'll do a sample calculation in a little bit to show you how we determine fluid levels for say a 70 kilo male. Now, how about energy? Now I'm gonna put some kilocals per kilogram per day values here. And I want you to think about something. I want you to think about each of these values will be assigned to a particular patient in the hospital. And can you think of what patient that is? So here it is again. When we think of energy, we have to think that you have your typical healthy adult male, and they're usually going to be at about 25 to 30 kilocals per kilogram per day. Now there's a spectrum from beginning from low to high of what your energy needs are. And we'll go through those here. So if you have somebody that is 15 to 20 kilocals per day, who's that? Well, that's going to be your person that's in severe malnutrition and they're at risk of refeeding syndrome and ask yourself, well, what is refeeding syndrome? Refeeding syndrome is when your body is in starvation mode and you give a high glycolytic load or a high glucose load. You're going to shift that patient from fatty acid oxidation and ketogenesis to now going right through the glycolytic cycle. And they're going to be producing so much ATP through that glycolytic cycle that they're going to use up all their phosphate. They're going to become hypophosphatemic. Now, when they become hypophosphatemic, they become confused, they have respiratory depression, and they can have cardiac arrest. Now, is there another, this is off topic a little bit, but can you think of another patient population that also gets hypophosphatemic after surgery? That patient population is gonna be your big liver resections. So big trisegmentectomies, after you do those, you can see that those patients on post-op day one or post-op day two, they can sometimes have a profound drop in their phosphorus and you'll need to supplement that in order to have good outcomes. <laughs> All right, moving on from 15 to 20 kcals per kilogram per day to 20 to 25. So this is you know, the morbidly obese patient. And as their BMI increases, they typically need less calories. So you can think that it's not because they're utilizing their fat for fuel, but based on their weight, as their BMI increases, they're actually going to need less and their total energy expenditure, their resting energy expenditure is actually quite low. And so these patients might require at least in the beginning, a little bit less than a uh, person who's not obese and has a normal BMI 25 to 30. That's going to be your healthy adult. If you can think about it, we have a 2000 calorie a diet. You take a 70 kilo male and uh, multiply by 30 and there you go, 2100 kilocals. So it kind of makes sense based on um, a recommended diet that we have. Now getting up over 30, so 35 and 40, these are going to be your really critically ill patients. So we typically think of burn patients as some of the most metabolically active and high energy expenditure patients in the hospital. And so I'd approximate them at 35, but they could be as high as 50. It just depends. But as you see that energy requirement going up, you have to think that those are sicker patients. So now the question becomes, how do you know where you're at? These parameters give you a really good idea of where to start, but let's say you're a week into it 
and maybe you're 10 days into it and you're saying to yourself, oh man, are we feeding this person correctly? I mean, if, if we're giving them enteral and parenteral nutrition, are we giving enough kilocals a day? So how do you know? What do you calculate? So I'm going to put up a picture here. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, but this usually, this cart can come by once or twice a week in the ICU. And this is called indirect calorimetry. So that's how you're going to know where you're at and what does this thing do? So indirect calorimetry calculates a respiratory quotient. And for you people in the audience that really like formulas, I'm going to put on a fantastic reference that's going to take you through all the formulas they use to calculate the respiratory quotient, but it's based on the volume of gas that you're inspiring and exp expiring and the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 within that gas, assuming that nitrogen is inert. And this can only be used in patients that have less than 60% FiO2 or else the number becomes quite skewed. There are some other reasons why you won't need to, why you wouldn't use indirect calorimetry and those will be included in the reference. But basically indirect calorimetry allows you to calculate the respiratory quotient and what is the respiratory quotient? That is the amount of oxygen consumed over carbon dioxide being produced. All right. So what does that mean? How does that help you? So there are a few numbers that you've memorized, but I'm going to make it simpler before we get into the carbohydrate protein fat numbers and may making it simpler. I want you to think that if your RQ or your respiratory quotient is over one, that means you're being overfed or you're overfeeding your patient. You're given too many kilocalories and that's going to risk being hyperglycemic that has its own consequences as well as hepatic steatosis. So what if your RQ is less than one? If your RQ is less than the one, that typically means that you're being underfed. All right. Now let's take a closer look at respiratory quotient. So we know that based on the number for the respiratory quotient, we know what fuel we're oxidizing. I use oxidizing instead of the word burning because oxygen is what's important in the respiratory quotient. I'm going to show you right here for the biochemists and the chemists in the audience. You're going to love this. All right. So I'm going to show you two things here. And one is going to be the oxidation of glucose. And second is going to be the oxidation of a fat. And our fat is going to be palmitate. Okay. So when you oxidize glucose, you look at the reaction here. So glucose is six C six H 12 O six. And that requires six oxygens to produce six carbon dioxides and six waters. Now, if you look at it, this is a balanced equation. You get six oxygens to oxidize glucose to get six carbon dioxides and water. So you have six over six and an RQ of one. All right. So that's where the one comes from. Now let's look at palmitate. Now palmitate, is C16 H32O2 and you need 23 oxygens to oxidize palmitate and that produces 16 carbon dioxides and 16 waters. And so 16 over 23 is 0 0.696, which is approximately 0.7 and that's why you get fats at 0.7. Now proteins, when you oxidize amino acids, those are right in between. All right. So I hope that cleared it up. So thinking about TPN, think about fluid and energy. And here we're going to summarize everything we learned today. So TPN can be thought of as fluid and energy. Know that the fluid requirements can follow the four to one rule. And you also have to take into account other outputs. Think about nasogastric tube output, how much edema is, if there's a chest tube or an open abdomen and how much fluid loss is from that, what their hemodynamics are and understand that this rule doesn't always fit with the clinical picture. And so you might have to make that up. You also have to think about fluid restricted patients, patients with cardiac, renal and pulmonary failure. They might not require as much fluid as you would estimate by the 421 rule. Looking at energy, energy can be estimated based on, based on patient assessment. So we have the patients with malnutrition we're really worried about, and they're going to be lower 
on their kcals per kilogram per day than patients who are going to be critically ill like a burn patient. And then finally, the respiratory quotient can help you determine where you're at and how much energy you need. If you just blindly give a lot of calories, you're gonna risk overfeeding a patient and that's gonna have its own consequences. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that today. I hope you learned something about fluid and energy. Again, if you haven't watched the metabolic response to injury videos, those are crucial for understanding everything about surgical nutrition. You can go back and watch part one, and that's gonna be the video on nutritional assessment. And our next video is gonna be on the bread and butter. That's gonna be the design and indications for total parental nutrition. All right, so let's go over a clinical scenario. That's gonna take everything we learned today and put it together. All right, so you have a 53 kilo, 45 year old female who was a trauma victim after a truck struck her on her bike. She sustained spine fractures requiring fusion as well as a severe traumatic brain injury. She's now intubated post-trauma day eight in the neurointensive care unit with pseudo obstruction and moderate bilious nasogastric tube output. The questions are, what are her daily fluid needs based on weight? And what things may change that value? And secondly, how would you determine her energy needs? So think about what those numbers are and the next week we'll get back to it. All right, thank you. So if you haven't had a chance to subscribe, go ahead, hit the subscribe button. If you haven't had a chance to set the reminders, set some reminders so you know when these videos come out. And finally, go ahead, leave some comments, leave some questions. I will get back to you. If there's anything that you want to learn that you want to know about surgery or as a life as a surgeon, it would be totally awesome to engage with you.